Welcome to Women Leaders in the Courts, a new program created and produced by the New York State Judicial Institute. I'm John Carr, Senior Advisor for Strategic and Technical Communications. The Women Leaders in the Courts program features interviews with just some of the remarkable women who sustain one of the largest and most complex court systems in the nation, if not the entire world. Today, we're joined by Eileen D. Millett, Counsel to the Office of Court Administration. Eileen, formerly a partner at Phillips Neiser in Manhattan, essentially runs a small government law firm. She oversees 18 attorneys who handle an enormous range of cases and address an endless stream of novel issues. She's a former assistant district attorney and a former assistant attorney general, and she spent much of her career in environmental law. Eileen, welcome to the program and thank you for being with the court systems leaders. You have a very distinct cultural background as the oldest daughter of not one, but two immigrants. Tell me a little bit about your parents, where they came from, and the values and the work ethics they instilled in all other children. I'm the oldest daughter of um, a Cuban immigrant who came to this country as a child. Um, always described herself as a proud black Cuban, arrived here as a child speaking no English and a dad who came from Trinidad and Tobago um, in his 20s, in his mid-20s, already a pharmacist, but with a desire to become a medical doctor. It's interesting that he applied to schools in the United States um, and was accepted actually to medical school in the South. But being black, he was told that he could not live on campus and um, he went to the Roman Catholic Church, being a good Roman Catholic, hoping that they could help him find accommodations. And they told him that they could not. And so my father left his first adopted country, the United States, for his second adopted country, uh, France, where he studied medicine at the Sorbonne for six years um, and left us when I was about four years old. Um, and my communication with my dad was really through the letters that he wrote to me um, exhorting me to set a good example and help my mother. Um, and oftentimes he'd sent me cards in French that he would translate for me. So I grew up hearing my mother speak Spanish and didn't really hear French, but I saw these lovely translations of wonderful cards that he sent me. Um, but John, I had so many wonderful examples um, in my family. My great grandfather, who was my inspiration to become an attorney, whom I grew up hearing my mother speak about all the time and thought when she told me of, that he had patented a medicine when he arrived in this country in his 60s and was accused of practicing medicine without a license and defended himself and won, I always assumed he was an attorney. I found out later that he was really a headmaster of a school and his desire was really to teach at Columbia University. That was not a goal that he ever achieved, but he was nonetheless very successful, becoming the leader, joining Marcus Garvey and becoming the leader of South and Central America and the provinces of the West Indies in the Universal Negro Improvement Association. My maternal grandmother um, became a, an officer in the Salvation Army. She was a captain and the prayer leader of her congregation. My mother's sister got her PhD at, in Romance Linguistics from Columbia University. So obviously it was always assumed that I would be a professional, that whatever we did, somehow we would be at the top of the profession. Although my dad's view was that medicine was really the field that surpassed all others. And he was very disappointed when I went to law school. Um, I don't know that I ever pleased him because his goal was I should have a JDMD and that's not something I ever achieved. As a black woman, a black Cuban woman, did you face any particular hurdles in law school or along the road to becoming an attorney? You know, John, I, I would say that it really had more to do with gender and, and less to do with race. I mean, I will say that I can remember a few incidents of what one would describe as bias when I was in law school, but I looked at the example that I've just described to you of folks in my own family who overcome so many challenges. Um, my aunt, for example, who really whose goal was to really work at the UN. 
She spoke five languages. Um, and that was not a goal that she achieved. She was never successful in getting a job at the UN, but she nonetheless persevered and became head of the language department at Mary Bertram High School. She authored many textbooks in Spanish, um, lived in Spain and took courses during the summer. So I had these wonderful examples to draw upon. And if in fact there were incidents of bias, when I looked at what had happened and how my dad spending six years away from his family and seeing us only in summers and sometimes at holidays, somehow my mother succeeding with five children um, without my dad most of the time. I, mean, I thought of those hardships and things that folks in my own family endured. And so even if there were incidents of, of bias, they, they didn't deter us. They didn't deter me because they didn't deter anybody in my family. Now, when you joined the court system in 2019, only about nine months ago, you were at the peak of a successful career. You'd worked in government, you'd worked for large law firms, you were a partner at Philip Snyzer. Why at that point in your career and in your life did you want to come to work for the courts? You know, John, you in working for clients can show them how to avoid liability, um, you can demonstrate to them how they can mitigate risks. Um, you can even demonstrate to them how they can reduce penalties if there are enforcement actions. And all of those things obviously can line your pocket, pockets and help your clients to uh, sustain and increase their own profits. Um, but when you look back at it and you ask yourself what you've really accomplished, um, given the examples that I've just demonstrated to you, I think you have to ask yourself, what, what can you do that's really consequential? And so when I was offered an opportunity, as, I was, as it was described to me, to become the highest ranking non-judicial person in the court system and to run, as you've described it, a small law office, for me it presented an opportunity to be at the helm of that office recommending and being instrumental in developing policies and practices that could have long ranging effect and long standing consequences. And that seemed to me to be a, something worthy of, uh, of a try. Now your role rather defies specialization. You have to be a jack of all trades. You represent judges and non-judicial uh, personnel and litigation. You play a large role in preparing the court system's legislative or political agenda. And in that capacity, encounter both small and large P, I suppose, politics. And you advise the administrative board, the five judges who set statewide policy for the entire state. What has prepared you to wear all of those hats? You know, to answer that question, I would direct everybody to a wonderful book that I read when we were in lockdown before the reset started in phase one and now phase two. Um, it's a book by David Epstein called Range, How Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. And um, while most people think that it makes some sense to uh, spend a lot of time and many hours and, and focus and specialize on one thing, uh, David Epstein, I think, was surprised to hear that Malcolm Gladwell, the writer for The New Yorker, um, actually agreed with him that being a generalist specialized, it helps people um, to get broader perspective. Um, you know, specialists really thrive in a world where patterns repeat themselves, um, and it's very, very good for deliberate thinkers. But Epstein describes what he calls a wicked learning environment where the rules of the game are not clear, but you allow yourself different experiences and you learn to be comfortable in different environments. So as you've said, Dave, um, I'm sorry, John, I've been a visiting professor at a law school. I've worked in government. I've been a prosecutor. I've been a general counsel. I was general counsel to a small tri-state water quality authority did work in ensuring that there would be clean waters in Greater New York Harbor. It had authority over New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Um, so I think all of those experiences have taught me to be comfortable in multiple worlds. 
What in this role are your most difficult decisions that you have to make? Well, you know, John, I think um, it's only starting now to become clear to us that as we relax restrictions and come back to what used to be normalcy, and I don't know that we'll ever come back to normal, it'll, it'll probably be a new normal, but I think the consequences of what we faced are, are going to mean that there will be serious budget constraints. And so I would say that personnel decisions are probably the most difficult ones. Um, the most recent ones, for example, as we came to phase one, even with, with 18 people, we had to think of who were the 25% pe persons that you brought back in phase one and, and who are going to be the 40% that you'd bring back in phase two. And while initially people seemed excited about the prospect of returning, um, invariably there were reasons why either because of their own fears about themselves or their families, they were not as anxious to return um, to the workplace. And so I would say that personnel decisions now, and I think ones that we're going to face in the future, um, when those inevitable budget constraints rear their ugly head, are the most difficult ones. Yeah, it will be a difficult time going forward, I'm sure. Now in your career, as in as everyone else has experienced, you've experienced good administrators and administrators that were not so good. In your mind, what distinguishes the good from the less than good? Well, I think the shining example that we can, that we all have in, in front of us is Andrew Cuomo, um, who many, I think, a few years ago saw as somewhat dull, um, I don't think it was easy in, in front of audiences. Um, I don't think many people had a good sense of, of who Andrew Cuomo was, but this pandemic has had him rise to the occasion and really become must-see television. Um, he's taken New York from being the largest number of cases of uh, COVID infections to the lowest number in the entire state. Um, if you watch those news conferences at 1130 or 12 o'clock every day, you saw him use charts and graphs and embrace science and listen to the experts. So I think he embodied all, embodies all the qualities that one would want to see in an administrator who is at the top of his game. So Andrew Cuomo is my example. Now, um, how would you describe your management style? Um, open door, top down, or, or is there a particular style that you ascribe to? As you've um, said, John, I, I run an office of 18 lawyers. Actually, that, that includes me, so let's say 19 rather, so 18 lawyers, um, all of whom have been here for an enormous, collectively an enormous amount of time. I've been here all of seven, eight months. Um, the folks here, I don't think anyone has been here for less than 10 years, uh, some even longer than that. So you have folks that are very, um, very, have honed their craft and not only have a great deal of experience in their individual disciplines, but also uh, have a great deal of experience in the unified court system. And as you know, part of getting to be able to do your job well is to know the people as well as the institution and the organization. So I would say the most important thing that I've been able to do and I've tried to do is to listen to people. And the harder thing that I've tried to strive to do is to be patient. Um, I'm a Gemini, so we like immediate results and we really love, we think of ourselves as very smart people. We like to surround ourselves with smart people, but we also like to get things done yesterday. And I've found that I've had to slow down my expectations about what I can accomplish and how quickly can I, I can accomplish it, which is a segue into another question you have, but I will go into that later about the differences between private and public. Um, but this is an institution where you have to get to know the people and you have to get to know 
you have to know the substance as well as the people. One of the things that the pandemic has helped us to do is that we've had daily calls, for example, with the district, um, with the deputy chief administrative judge for upstate, with the deputy chief administrative judge for the New York City courts, with the chief judge and the chief administrative judge. Of course, the chief judge and administrative judge I've worked with more closely as part of the administrative board, but on the calls that I've described, there are upwards of 50 to 70 people. And so it means that I had the opportunity for the months that we were in lockdown to listen to the concerns of those people, um, to understand what it is that they thought was important about their particular jobs and to understand the personalities um, as well as the substance of what they wanted to achieve. So I would say listening and learning are, are the things that are most important in, in managers and those are things that I, I think I've had to embrace simply because when you don't have the opportunity to be able to reach out and touch someone, I think it's even more important that you listen. Um, and again, as I said, that's been very hard because it's felt as though things have been slowed down, but in some ways they've speeded up because it's forced the court system to embrace a lot of technical systems that some attorneys and even judges are not comfortable with, but all of us have had to get very, very comfortable with technology and adapt, um, and in some instances even substitute uh, for what we thought was the best way, which was the in-person communication. I want to follow up on something uh, you said a moment ago about the differences between uh, managing in the public and the private sector. So what is the difference? Well, I would I would say that the private sector is more hierarchical. Um, and I think if you're an associate at a, law, at a law firm, you feel that much more acutely because your reporting uh, line is to perhaps a more senior associate first and then, then to a junior partner and then to a senior partner much less interaction with a managing partner or somebody at, at the top of the food chain. Um, I do think that in the public sector, one would think change should come easily, but I found that that's exactly the opposite. Because despite what I've said about having to adapt to new systems on a technical level, um, the Office of Court Administration is a huge behemoth of, of an animal, if you will. It's like a, like a battleship. And even though I think it deserves high marks for adapting in these odd times that we've lived through, I don't think it's come very easily. So for example, when you, when you posit different policies or practices, it's not so much that you get pushback, but you certainly get a lot of curiosity as to why it is you think there's a different way or a better way when we've always done it this way and we've done it this way for 10 years or 20 years. And why do you think you new kid on the block that your way makes more sense? Well, let me take it one step further. Is managing in the public sector different than managing in the private sector for a woman? I, I, I wouldn't say that. You know, I think even though we, we function in I think a profession that is still dominated in the hierarchy by males, um, there are still a significant number of women. Again, if you, there was a report on women in the courts that was recently adopted by the State Bar Association and they, re they found that women have not really attained speaking roles in the way that we would have thought would have been accomplished at this juncture. Um, we still don't see women in, in the leadership positions, um, but I would, I would still say that there are enough women so that my expectation is that that will change. Um, and that as we see more women in leadership positions, you will see more women taking speaking roles and you'll see more women taking charge. I mean, we have a, a court of appeals that's led by a very able, very capable, very strong, um, very driven chief judge um, who I think is an example 
to be looked at not just in New York, but across the nation. So I do think that um, I don't know that there are there are more challenges for women, but I think there are wonderful examples of women leading and women stepping into leadership positions. Do you think or has it been your experience that women tend to manage differently from men? Is there a woman way of managing? I think that women tend to be more hands on and, and I can give you an example. So I, I talked about the daily calls with the deputy chief administrative judge of the upstate and the downstate courts. Um, what we dealt with in trying to be sure that we could uh, manage a court system when you didn't have in per in person interaction and we came we kept coming into a, a problem being raised by county clerks um, and the count the clerks county clerks really have two distinct roles one is the clerk of the county and and the other is the clerk of the court uh, there are two sets of statutes that deal with those obligations there are different sets of responsibilities the structures are very different. So this is what I kept hearing as again new kid on the block and while I could read the statutes and see that there were differences I think it was really difficult to grasp the nuance and so I decided to take myself down to the county clerk's office and spend a day with them. Um, they said they had not had a council do that ever um, so I spent a day talking with the clerks in the county court looking at their indexes, looking at how they documented the receipt of papers, how they accepted fines and for or fees for certain documents that had to be filed, construction loans and grants, for example. Um, I looked firsthand with their uh, technical people at how it is that they received information. Um, so sitting across from them with my mask on and and my gloves, um, and spending an entire day with them, I came away with not just a better understanding of what the county clerks did and how they functioned, um, but I also think I came away with them having a different kind of regard for council's office and council. Um, and that is something that the five county clerks communicated to me. So just an example perhaps of I don't know if it's a women's management style, but maybe my management style that seemed to resonate with um, with folks that are really important in the court system. Now you came into the court system with a lot of experience and a very impressive resume, but I imagine you still had to earn the trust and confidence of those who are working for you, as does any manager coming from the outside. How do you do that? So again, John, two things, two answers. One, I think patience, um, because one would have imagined, well, you know, you come into a, an entirely new system um, where you have to learn the system and you have to learn the people. Um, you've got to give yourself at least six months to do that. I didn't have six months. Um, we were we were confronted with a global pandemic um, and then that made it even more difficult because it meant that you no longer had that. You couldn't interact personally with people because you were told that you were you're forbidden from, from doing that. Um, so when it was when it was appropriate, um, I did what I've explained to you a moment ago that I did, which is to spend a day in the county clerk's office. But I also, when I was getting frustrated and talked with people in the court system, mentors that I look to, people like Judge Betty Ellerin, um, she cautioned, as did Judge Alan Shankman, also a mentor, be patient, Eileen. Um, wait, a, wait a little while. Um, you can't expect things are going to uh, going to be as they were. This is this is a different time that we're all living through. And it took me a minute to absorb and process that advice, but I think it was terrific advice. Um, and I think that's what I've done. It sounds like the takeaway for other women department heads or women who want to be department heads is listen, be patient, get to know people. What else would you advise them? Um, be strong and have heart. Have heart. What do you mean by that? You know, 
Un understand that um, when, for example, an attorney says to you, um, I I'm really having a great deal of, of difficulty thinking about returning. Um, I have three children at home. I'm not really sure how I'm going to find childcare. They're varying ages. One could perhaps go to day camp, but you know, a three-year-old and a four-year-old, I may not be able to do that with. I may not be able to get uh, a nanny um, because of the difficulties and fears that people have about transmitting this the virus. Um, but you try to be understanding and you try to say if there's a way that that individual could work from home um, and not have to be in the office, Let's allow that accommodation to occur. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for your time and thank you for your leadership in the courts. Thank you.